Okay, Katie, sorry, can you start talking? I sure can. Are we here? Are we here? So you guys, will you just chat when the stream starts so we know? Oh, yeah, I have it open in another. Okay, app. yeah, I'm going to start streaming any second now and then um, and then Alex just get ready to introduce right at uh, 10 o'clock then. Sounds great. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alex Delvoy, and I will be moderating this session. I'm excited to introduce Kitty Belfus, um, who is the Outreach Programs Director for the Wisconsin Wetlands Association, a statewide nonprofit conservation organization working to help people and communities care for wetlands. She has been involved in bringing more recognition and awareness of Wisconsin wetlands for more than 15 years. Katie has a master's degree in land resources from UW-Madison's Gaylord Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. And with that, I will let Katie take it from here. Super, thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate it. I'm really happy to be here today to talk about some wonderful wetlands. I love wetlands and I love talking about them and I'm excited to share them with you. Uh, two different kinds of wetlands, special designations here in Wisconsin, uh, wetland gems and Ramsar wetlands of international importance. So um, hopefully you'll come away from the session with a list of great places to put on your natural area visitation bucket list. And forwarding the slides. Uh, first, before I get going, I wanted to just uh, tell you a little bit about the Wisconsin Wetlands Association in case we are new to you. We are a statewide nonprofit, nonpartisan conservation organization, and we help people and communities care for wetlands. Uh, we help people see wetlands as solutions to the water challenges that might be facing their communities, uh, whether that be uh, flooding or water quality issues. Um, and, and we help them find solutions to those challenges. We are a member supported organization. And so if you are not already a member and you're interested in this work, I invite you to join us today. And um, we can uh, do, learn more about our work at wisconsinwetlands.org. So I can see that some of you have already found uh, the poll feature. Um, uh, the fine folks at Extension Lakes asked us to make these presentations interactive if we could. And so I took them at their word and we'll have a bunch of poll questions here. So uh, for right now, I'm gonna sort of do the polls uh, at a specific time. I'll tell you when to do a given question and now they're listed in the order. So you don't need to move forward. If you could just order, uh, answer questions one and two right now. The first one, and you can find the poll button. Those of you who haven't found it already, there's a tab for the chat, a tab for the Q&A and right in that same area, there should be a tab for the polls. And so if you just click that tab, you should see the polls there. The first question is, have you heard of wetland gems and or Ramsar? And you just pick one of those choices. And the second choice is how many designated Ramsar wetlands of international importance in Wisconsin can you name? And I have the poll results coming up right here. Oh, we have some people in our audience who have heard of both of them. And a couple of people who say, I have no idea what you're talking about. So you're in the right place. Uh, that is super. And the second question, uh, how many designated Ramsar wetlands of international importance in Wisconsin can you name? Unfortunately, uh, a lot of people are saying, huh? But that's not unfortunate because you're here. And so hopefully I'll do my job well and you are gonna learn by the end. And a couple of folks in the audience uh, do know um, a couple of our Ramsar wetlands of importance here in Wisconsin. So thank you for doing that poll. And uh, the results are continuing to pour in, but I will move along because we'll have a couple of more polls coming up shortly. So what are wetlands? This is the first question that I get when I do talks like these. And so I wanna just cover that really quickly. And I wanna actually throw that back to you. If we're gonna talk about wetlands in this session, I need to know um, about uh, what you all know already about wetlands so I know how deep to go in on the sort of general stuff. So look at questions three and four. For question three, um, 
take a look at this list of characteristics and select any that you think apply to wetlands. And then for question four, select the wetland types on the list that you think we have here in Wisconsin. And so we have a lot of people who think they have cattails. They support rare plants. They are wet. They are open. So far, that it's even Stephen. And there's other options as well. So people are getting the fact that these were a little bit trick questions. So wetlands are in between the places that are always dry and the places that are always wet. That's the pretty straightforward answer. Uh, there's a lot of technical um, aspects when it comes to regulation and delineation about what is a wetland, but this works really well. And it's that dynamic nature of the fact that sometimes they're because they're in the middle, sometimes they're wetter and sometimes they're drier. And the, the, that cycle is really important for sort of determining uh, where wetlands are and what kinds of wetlands will show up in those places. Uh, next poll results were uh, which of the following wetland types are found here. So we, here's my answers to that first poll question, which of course, yes, they have cattails, but not all of them. Yes, they support rare plants, most of them. Yes, they are wet, but not always. Uh, yes, they have dark PD soils, some of them, but as you can see in this picture, there's some dark PD soils on the right and some really pale so soils on the left, both of them being wetland soils, just of different types. Some of them are open, some of them are wooded, some of them have shrubs. And so that was a little trick question because all of those can be wetland characteristics, but they don't necessarily have to be uh, things that we see in wetlands. And just for your information, dark PD soil was the top vote getter uh, in the poll there about what are some wetland characteristics. Moving on to the next question. Um, again, uh, I, I'm looking at the poll results and a lot of folks uh, see that, of course, there are lots of these kinds of wetlands in Wisconsin. What we find is that a lot of people have in their mind's eye when they sit here, the word wetland, marshes and deep water wetlands, like we see here in the slides. You got your cattails, you got your water birds, you got your open water. This is what people think of as wetlands. And it is, they are wetlands. But there's lots of other ty types of wetlands in Wisconsin, as I can see many of you know. Sedge meadows and low prairies, like the what you see in the foreground of this photo, um, often look more grassy and sedgy and, and prairie-like to many people. They often don't look like they are wet, but I promise you, in a, the right time of year, if you were walking in that sedge meadow, you would have very wet boots. Floodplain forests, super important wetlands along um, river corridors, uh, great for absorbing floodwaters, uh, and really important for settling out of uh, sediments and things as well. Forested wetlands, these come in both uh, deciduous and coniferous varieties, lots of cool um, tamarack and black spruce uh, swamps and um, emerald ash borer, of course, is hitting hard uh, in those swamps that are deciduous with ash trees. Shrub thickets, and I love this picture because this is actually what it looks like to walk through a shrub thicket. Any of you have tried to do that in an alder thicket or a shrub car know that they're very challenging communities to walk through. Fens, a super rare uh, kind of uh, plant community, wetland community in Wisconsin that's associated with very specific hydrologic conditions and um, groundwater conditions. Lots of rare plants uh, found in these because it's a challenging growing environment. So there's a special group of plants who have really adapted to be able to grow there. Bogs, uh, this is my friend Mandy and she's out there jumping up and down on the bog, floating bog mat that many bogs have. If any of you have had that experience, um, that's super cool that the mat of vegetation floats on the top of the water and, and you can actually feel it bouncing underneath you, very fun. Now, ephemeral and seasonal ponds, I would say that they are probably the most underrepresented in our mapping of wetlands and under-recognized in terms of wetland types because they are not wet most of the time. Once upon a time, uh, someone said to me, that can't be a wetland, I can drive my truck through that. Well, maybe so in September, but you probably wouldn't drive your truck through there in April because it'd be so muddy. And I would just say, since you're a lake audience, um, you might drive your truck on a lake in Wisconsin in the winter, but you wouldn't in the summer. And the fact that you can drive it in the winter doesn't mean it's not a lake. It's just a lake that's frozen. 
I would say the same about these wetlands. They are for sure wetlands, even though they are dry some of the time. And they are super important for our amphibian friends, frogs and salamanders. This is where all of that breeding happens. And without these little ephemeral ponds that fill up in the spring and get warm really early in the spring, right now, I'm sure they are hopping with activity as things warm up and spring comes to us. So keep an eye out for those. They're often found in woodlands and they might be overlooked as wetlands. They might not be mapped, uh, but they still are wetlands. Okay, now we're moving on to Wisconsin's uh, history with wetlands and wetland extent. And I promise you, I'm gonna get to GEMS and Ramsar soon. I just wanted to cover some of the background. So um, number five is how many acres of lakes does Wisconsin have? Number six is how many acres of wetlands did Wisconsin have before European settlement? And number seven is what percentage of Wisconsin's historic wetlands have we lost to conversion, drainage, and development? So looking at acres of lakes, 10 million is what folks are coming in. That's the top answer here. And the acres of wetlands, 15 million. Ooh, I love it. Uh, also uh, lots of folks voting for 10 million. And here we have the answers to what percentage of Wisconsin's historic wetlands have we lost? 50% uh, uh, of the people are saying we've lost 75%. And I love there's one person who said, at least we have lost less than they have in Illinois because poor Illinois has lost a lot more than we have. So um, yes, in fact. So now we'll go ahead and look at the answers. Acres of lakes, 1 million acres of lakes in Wisconsin. That is a lot of lakes. But once upon a time, we had 10 million acres of wetlands in Wisconsin. We think of ourselves as being a very uh, lake rich state and we are, uh, but look at that 10 to one historically of wetland acreage to lake acreage. Unfortunately, those of you who said we have lost 50% of our wetlands are correct. We have lost half of our wetlands. Um, it is uh, better than our, some of our neighboring states uh, and certainly um, uh, we don't wanna lose many more because we've lost a lot already. And sometimes, uh, depending on where you are in the state, uh, sometimes the acres of wetlands to lakes is actually um, quite a bit higher even than 10 to one. Uh, but we won't go about that right now. The challenge with wetland loss, and this might be why some people uh, thought that 75% was the right number. Thank goodness we haven't lost that many yet, but the wetland loss is not spread out equally. So in this map, uh, we have the darker the red color, the more acres of wetlands we have lost in that area. And so clearly Southern Wisconsin has lost a lot more um, wetland acreage than Northern Wisconsin. And largely that's because of, of agricultural conversion and the, um, the, the, that's what we're doing in the Southern part of the state is, is more agriculture than what we've got up North in terms of row crops anyway. So we have way more wetlands than lakes. And yet when we share these numbers with people about how many acres of wetlands we have uh, compared to lakes, people are really surprised. They don't, because they see a lot of lakes, they think there's just way more lakes. How could there be wetlands? There's not that many wetlands. But I think there's a bunch of reasons. Most, as I said before, a lot of people look at, they just look for marshes. And when they see a marsh, they can understand that's a wetland. But a lot of these other types that we, we showed earlier don't come to mind. They're also harder to access and anybody who's tried to put their canoe in uh, in some wetlands knows how hard they can be to, to navigate to get into. But I also think there's a cultural aspect. Um, we are we have typecast wetlands as wastelands and barriers to progress for a really, really long time and not just in the United States, but a lot, a lot of places because they are challenging. Um, there certainly are mosquitoes. There certainly has been disease associated with wetlands before, but um, they, it's really, they've become dark, scary uh, places. And, and this Swamp Thing um, comic book and movies all, uh, all relate to that. And so we have this sort of cultural understanding of wetlands as sort of bad places that I think is part of um, uh, what people don't understand about wetlands, why people don't wanna understand about wetlands or may not. So it's also comes in in our speech. And so if you go to the next poll, uh, number eight, which of the following phrases have you used? I am really swamped with work. They were mired in debt and my Wi-Fi was really bogged down yesterday. Have you ever said anything kind of like this? Maybe not those exact words, but if you use the word swamped, mired, and bogged down in a, in a way that's talking about something maybe not so good. And uh, we have lots of yeses to those. Uh, and I agree with you. I think a lot of people use these phrases and don't think about it. 
So I encourage you to listen to your own language and hear when you might be inadvertently bashing wetlands and don't be a wetland basher. In our office, we avoid phrases like swamped, mired, and bogged down because uh, we don't want to do that. And so we say paved over. And some people have also suggested flooded um, as a way that you could avoid that term. So just listen. It's kind of fun when you when you start listening. It's, it's all over the place there. And it's fun to point that out to people because people haven't thought about it before. Um, lots of us have not thought about that as being um, uh, negative wetland connotations. All right, now to the meat of the action here. I'm finally getting to what I said I was gonna talk about in this presentation, and I'm gonna start with wetland gems. And the background there was to say, give you the sort of background about why, why we came up with this um, idea of designating wetland gems in Wisconsin. We wanted to do a, an effect, a casting change of wetlands to, to define them more as treasures uh, rather than wastelands. We wanted to show folks how varied Wisconsin's wetlands are, how many types we have. We wanted to show folks that we have cool wetlands all over the state of Wisconsin. And we wanted to make it easier for people to find wetlands near them that they could visit so they could see these places up close and personal. And so we, uh, in 2009, designated 100 wetlands in Wisconsin as wetland gems. We selected these 100 sites based on their ecological value as recognized by lots of different planning documents, including stuff by the Nature Conservancy and the DNR. Um, we used a modified version of the DNR's ecological landscapes, if you're familiar with that. We just um, uh, winnowed the number of uh, regions down to a smaller, more manageable eight ecoregions, and those were based on um, geology and soils and climate to sort of uh, define certain regions of the state. And then we made sure that um, when we chose those wetland gems that we had representative types of the different wetland communities that were found in each of those ecoregions of the state. Um, so one important note, sometimes people think, oh, the wetland gems, those are the only ones that we that are good or that are important or that we need to protect and save. And that's not true at all. This is a sampling of high quality wetlands. It's a way of calling attention to some really great places, but it is in no way saying that these are the only good wetlands or these are the only ones worth protecting or saving. It's just, it's just a sampling. So we created some materials that I just wanted to point out so that if you're interested in looking at them, you can find them on our website. Uh, there was an overview um, on the left here and the Wetlands of Wisconsin Guide to Types of Wetlands in Wisconsin on the right. Those are both available on our website for um, download or, or viewing. We also created maps of each of the eight regions showing where those wetland gems were found. And sort of of greatest interest to me anyway, is we created a one page fact sheet for each of the 100 wetland gem sites. Um, these are all PDF documents available on our website that you can print and download whenever you would like. Um, I print them out and stick them in my gazetteer when I know we're going on vacation in a per particular part of Wisconsin and I wanna go visit some of these places. Um, so I just keep them in my gazetteer, you know, so that I have them available when we're out and around the state. Um, I will, wisconsinwetlands.org is our website, and I can, I'll give you some more information um, in the chat box later about uh, where on our website specifically we can find that, not the chat box, well, the chat box, somehow, I'll get you that information, don't you worry. So the vast number of these sites um, are open to the public for hiking, paddling, and other recreation, and so we, that's, you know, that's an important part of it. Not all of them are, there's a couple that are not open to the public, but most of them are. Each sheet has information about the landowners of that site special recognitions or designations that that site might have, um, ecology and significance, how big it is, what kind of natural communities you can find there, special flora and fauna, cool things you can um, see there or that you might take a look for. Um, a little commentary about threats. Um, that's of course an ever-changing thing, but um, some of the primary threats for each of the sites we listed. And then we provide information about access to the sites. And because we don't own or manage any of these sites, we pretty much give you a link somewhere uh, to information about where you can find out from the landowner or manager um, how they suggest that you access the sites. Now, a lot of them are owned by the Department of Natural Resources. There's a lot of state natural areas amongst the, uh, these wetland gems. Um, other groups like the Nature Conservancy um, own a lot of these properties. And so there's, uh, we just point you in the direction of where you can get information from the landowner about access. 
So as we were announcing and celebrating the designation of these uh, wetland gems with events and media and other fun stuff to kick that off and promote that wetland gems designation, we wondered if there was a way that these wetlands of sort of statewide importance could help inform uh, wetlands of international importance under the Ramsar Convention. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit now, switch gears and talk about Ramsar, and then I'll come back and talk about how those two things uh, are related for us. So the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands is an intergovernmental treaty that provides the framework for national action and international cooperation for the conservation and wise use of wetlands and their resources. It's called Ramsar. Some people say, think it's an acronym because it's sort of a weird name, Ramsar, and a lot of people write it with all caps, but actually Ramsar is the name of the city in Iran where the convention was first signed way back in 1971. So that's why it's called the Ramsar Convention. It's the only global environmental treaty dedicated to a specific ecological community, which I think is pretty cool. And the United States joins more than 170 other member nations across the globe. And when a, a nation becomes party to the convention, um, they agree to work actively to support the three pillars of the convention, to work towards the wise use of wetlands, to cooperate and communicate internationally about wetlands with regard to research and management and protection strategies, and to designate wetlands of international importance. And there's this overall um, set of criteria that um, any, any, any nation who's trying to nominate wetlands of international importance, designate them within their own boundaries, they all have to go through the same sort of checklist, the criteria list, the application process, the form that where you provide information about the site is, is uh, the same across the globe. Everybody has to fill out that same form. But then each nation can also set up its own uh, other additional requirements for a nomination uh, for the designation review. So in the United States, the Fish and Wildlife Service is the agency that oversees that process. Um, we have to fill any nomination package includes the Ramsar information sheet that I mentioned, all of the landowners whose property is proposed to be included in the Ramsar site, have to um, agree to that and provide a letter of support saying, yes, I'm happy to have my land included here. And then um, they recommend other letters of support from communities, from other conservation organizations, from elected officials and decision makers to sort of help it also be part of the community saying, yeah, this is cool. We wanna have this designation because we see the value. Um, there was a survey done probably 10 years ago now of um, the current, at that time, the current list of Ramsar sites in the United States. And that survey found that folks felt like they were able to do better raising funds to support um, the work at those sites because it looked really impressive and it is really impressive to be able to list that you're a Ramsar wetland of international importance on your funding applications, that it increased scientific interest in the sites because people were like, oh, this is a wetland of international importance. We need to you know, make sure we're following and learning and uh, monitoring all of these things. And that it in, in fact had the opportunity to increase public engagement in the site. If you can help um, promote in, as part of your outreach and marketing saying, hey, come and visit our wetland, uh, that it's a wetland of international importance, a lot of more people are going to be interested in that and come and enjoy and visit those resources and thus bring their um, ecotourism dollars into the community. So um, that is some of the just a sort of quick overview of the nomination process and more than 2400 wetlands of international importance have been designated around the globe to date. In the United States, out of those 2,400 sites, we have 41, that's it, just 41, our big, huge country. And they're all wonderful places, but it seems like a pretty small number for such a big country with so many wonderful resources. So uh, back in 2010, there were actually only like 24 or 26 wetlands of international importance and WWA got involved in an effort to try to increase the number of Ramsar wetlands of international importance that had been designated in the United States to increase that number. Um, and so we also looked at, um, well, could this wetland gems list, this sort of list of wetlands of statewide importance, be a good list to use as a starting place to identify wetlands in Wisconsin that really deserved or would, would readily qualify for this international designation? Um, in 2010, we had two wetlands of international importance in Wisconsin, Horicon Marsh and the Upper Mississippi River floodplain wetlands. So we put together this community, uh, this Ramsar uh, committee uh, Wisconsin Ramsar Committee, who uh, worked together to review the list of wetland gems and decide which wetlands on that list did they think would pretty much slam dunk that ramp that uh, those criteria uh, for Ramsar designation. And so these state these sites were um, uh, all across the state of Wisconsin. 
Um, and we knew that one big reason that people weren't, or we, we assessed, we decided, uh, we assumed that one of the reasons folks weren't applying for um, Ramsar designation for their really cool wetlands was, A, they didn't know what the heck Ramsar was because it's not a very well-known thing in the United States. And that um, the nomination process was a little bit daunting. It sounded hard, it sounded time consuming. Um, and so folks were scared off given their already big workloads. And so Wisconsin Wetlands Association started the process of one by one reaching out to the landowners of these sites, the managers of these sites to encourage them to apply and to offer them assistance in navigating that process of helping understand what the designation process is, helping connect them with other folks who knew more about that to get them the advice um, and whatnot that they would need to move forward and just sort of help um, provide that uh, reminder that this is something really cool that they could do and, and just support folks through that process. So as a result, I'm happy to say uh, we have uh, helped four new sites in Wisconsin receive this prestigious international designation so that we have a total of six now in Wisconsin, which is super cool. Uh, the first one we helped with was the Kakagan and Bad River Sloughs up on Lake Superior. That was designated in 2012 and was the 2001, how do you say that? It was, wet, it was the wetland of international importance number 2001 in the whole globe, which I thought was sort of a cool number. The Door Peninsula Coastal Wetlands in Door County uh, were designated in 2014. The Chewaukee, Illinois Beach Lake Plain way down in Southeast Wisconsin, it's a, a cross-border state with land in both Wisconsin and Illinois, designated in 2015. And then just last summer, the Lower Wisconsin Riverway was designated a wetland in, of international importance. So I'm gonna give you a super quick whirlwind tour of these six sites, um, which hopefully will just whet your appetite for learning more. And I will tell you after um, I go through that, how you can find out more information and learn more about these sites. So the first place was Horicon Marsh, designated in um, 1990. That's in Dodge County. I bet most of you have been there. At 32,000 acres, it's one of the largest freshwater marshes in the United States. Um, at the, the south part of the uh, marsh is owned by the DNR and the north part by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and they coordinate well on management and whatnot. Um, it supports vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered species. Uh, at the time of its nomination, those included the bald eagle, the peregrine falcon, and whooping cranes. And to, even today, it's, it's very much a part of the whooping crane reintroduction project uh, that's happening here in Wisconsin. Uh, it supports plant and animal species at a critical stage in their life cycles, which is one of the criteria um, that Ramsar has. And it is hugely important for Canada goose and mallard stopover habitat. Certainly lots of other species as well, but those are really the, the claim to fame for the sites. A lot of folks uh, came from far and wide to see that migration, still do at Horicon Marsh. Upper Mississippi River floodplain wetlands. So this is a, a long uh, corridor along the Upper Mississippi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Most of the property is owned by the Fish and Wildlife Service as part of the Fish and Wildlife uh, Refuges. But also there's some land in there with National Park Service and the DNRs of both Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. Um, it provides critical habitat for the rare Higgins eye pearly mussel, the sheep nose mussel, and the spectacle case mussel. There's the sheep nose mussel there on the slide. It forms the central core of the Mississippi Flyway on North America's um, most significant river. About 40% of the continent's waterfowl use this flyway. And anybody who's been there in the fall uh, in particular knows how abundant uh, the birds are in migration there. 40% of canvasback ducks use this um, site and 20% of the tundra swan fly through here and use the upper Mississippi River marshes. Um, so significant populations of more than 100 native fish species including important spawning, nursery, feeding, and wintering habitats. All right then, Kakagan and Bad River Sloughs is way up north on Lake Superior. Um, it is the largest, most intact wetland on Lake Superior and um, the only wholly tribally owned Ramsar site in the United States, owned and managed by the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. It's the largest undeveloped wetland complex on the upper Great Lakes and the only remaining wild uh, coastal wild rice wetland of its size in the whole Great Lakes region. It supports the rare and elusive gray wolf and Canada lynx, um, uh, very important for the endangered piping plover. Uh, large populations of lake sturgeon, uh, including the largest spawning area for lake sturgeon on the south shore of Lake Superior, and again critical stopover habitat 
It's also super important for cultural resources for the tribe. Uh, the area is very important. All of their, it supports a lot of cultural practices, including wild rice harvest, trapping, hunting, fishing, um, and other, other cultural practices, a very important resource for the tribe. The Door Peninsula Coastal Wetlands. Uh, this site was designated in 2014. It's a complex of wetlands that's not all contiguous because it, it's just uh, the protected sites uh, in, a, in the in, in Door County. So there's a lot of private land in amongst the designated area, but uh, lots of various owners. I will read them off here because it's a long list, but lots of owners and managers up there. And it's super cool that the way they have come together in part through the nomination process here, but they're really doing a lot of collective um, decision-making management funding applications to manage the site rather than sort of this parcel, that parcel, that parcel. There's a little bit of that that happens of course, but it, they're doing a really nice job of managing it collectively. Um, globally significant wetland communities, including interdunal wetland and northern wet mesic forest. Um, there's three wetland gems at this site. All of these sites, as I said earlier, they're all wetland gems in one way or another, but this actual um, Ramsar site includes three different wetland gems. Uh, 76 rare species, including the largest known population of the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly the dwarf lake iris and the dune thistle. Those dwarf lake irises are so beautiful. If you're up there in the springtime, it's just a carpet. You know, they're endangered because they're not found in very many places, but where they are, they are in abundance and so beautiful. More than 150 species of birds um, used for nesting or staging uh, during migration. And the ridge and swale wetlands uh, from the historic Lake Michigan water level um, variation the, that little picture here with the rainbow is one of those uh, ridge and swale communities at the Ridges Sanctuary. And that's the swale that you can see there with the water. And then the wooded areas on both sides are the ridges. And uh, the fact that that sort of happens in such a physically small area provides some super cool habitat diversity that's really important for a lot of species. So if you haven't been up there, Ridges Sanctuary is a great place to visit, um, as are a number of the preserves owned by the Nature Conservancy and the Door County Land Trust. Chewaukee, Illinois Beach Lake Plain, designated in 2015. Again, a lot of owners and managers because it's a very developed area. So there's lots of different parcels going on there, but a lot of, again, good coordination. Um, it's the highest quality coastal dune and swale ecosystem in southeastern Wisconsin and northeastern Illinois. Six globally rare and representative wetland types, two federally listed species, including the eastern prairie fringed orchid and the piping plover. The largest known population of landings turtle, and the largest near contiguous block of stopover habitat for migratory birds along the Illinois coast and Southwest Michigan coast in Wisconsin. It's a little bit that that is a, there's a whole nother story there, a whole nother talk about the establishment and the protection of the Chewaukee Prairie. It was all platted for the development and second homes and um, all of those parcels. There was even street signs and they were starting to put in sidewalks and things in the 60s and 70s. and um, slowly but surely and through some heroic efforts, they've managed to protect and uh, prevent most of that development and protect this really rare community. And last but definitely not least, our most recently designated wetland of international importance, the Lower Wisconsin Riverway. It was designated, this says it was designated in February last year, but the public announcement didn't happen until September for a lot of reasons, including COVID, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, managed mostly by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, but also uh, the Ho-Chunk Nation owns several hundred acres. The Bureau of Land Management owns the islands in the middle of the riverway, some of them anyway. Uh, and there's also uh, some private individuals who asked that their land be included in the designation because they thought it was super cool. Uh, so um, this is the longest free flowing stretch of river in the Midwest, um, and it flows into its sister Ramsar site, the upper Mississippi um, River wetlands. Uh, one of the most important parts of the site is the fact that it's uh, in mostly contiguous uh, opportunity for habitat from the high bluffs all the way down through the prairies and savannas and wetlands to the riverway itself. And that is super important for so many of the species that need this corridor and that live in this corridor. It's one of the highest concentrations of rare and threatened species in Wisconsin found in this area. The wood turtle, the blandings turtle, again, mussels, the Higgins eye pearly mussel was another um, reason that this site was uh, deemed of high quality for Ramsar designation. It's an important bird area. Um, again, a super important migratory flyway and important spawning and migratory habitat for nearly 100 fish species. 
So beautiful place. If you have not spent time down there, I really encourage it. And the Friends of the Lower Wisconsin Riverway have some really great tools, including um, a, a trip planner that helps you sort of know where you want to put in and take out on the river, uh, depending on how long you'd like to have your paddle be. It's a beautiful place. So I said you could find out more about these. That was a very short whirlwind tour of these sites. I don't um, own or manage any of them, and so I don't know as much about them as a lot of other people. But uh, as part of our Wisconsin Wetlands Association Wetland Coffee Break uh, last year, we featured a series of presentations uh, uh, from folks who do own and manage these sites about these wonderful places. And all of those are available um, as recordings from last fall, wisconsinwetlands.org slash wetland coffee break. You can go and find all of those um, recordings there so that you can learn more about these places from the people who know them best. Now, before I wind up the session, uh, I, and I'm happy to take questions that you might have in just a minute, I'd like to do two final polls. And these are sort of a redo from our questions at the beginning so I can see if I did my job well. So go ahead and do the final two polls, number nine and number 10. How many wetland gems are found in Wisconsin? And number 10, how many designated Ramsar wetlands of international importance in Wisconsin can you name now that we have done this presentation? And so go ahead and click on your responses there to that poll. We got results coming in. And I wonder if some of you answered this poll before you heard the talk, because people are saying there's 25 wetland gems in Wisconsin and there's 100. So 23% of you got the answer correct. Well done. And for that last question, uh, how many designated rams are wetlands of international importance? Again, I. I think maybe you might have answered the question before this part of the talk because most people are saying, huh? But I think now that you've heard the talk, you might know a few more than you did when you started. So um, thanks for engaging. This is the fun of live polling, right? You just never know whether it's gonna, uh, how it's gonna work out or not. So I really appreciate your listening to me today and learning about these wonderful wetlands. And I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Katie. Looks like we don't have any questions yet, but we'll wait a few seconds for those to come up if there are any. Sure. And I'll just say in the meantime that um, there's a lot of opportunities to visit some of these Ramsar sites uh, through festi the Festival of Nature up in Door County. They offer trips every year to highlight many of these sites. We will be doing a Lower Wisconsin Riverway paddle field trip as part of the um, Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin field trip series this summer. So that's an opportunity. Um, and occasionally there's uh, there's a, the, that Shawamigan Bay Birding and Nature Festival up north in the Superior area. And often they will have trips to the Kakagan and Bad River Sloughs. That's a site that's not open to public visitation without permission. It's a tribally owned property and you need to get permission from the tribe for those visits, but they're very generous um, for special field trips like that at opening up the property. And it's a beautiful place. If you have not been there before, it's really worth the tour. It's really beautiful. We did have some commentary in the chat. Um, so, we have some people that love using the language and replacing with flooded. Um, we have a comment about no links in Wisconsin, um, maybe Martin, which are endangered. Uh, all right. We had someone that answered that they did do the poll before. Yeah. <laughs> you just never know what's going to happen, right? That's fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> When I set that up to have all those poll questions, I wasn't quite sure how it was going to work in EventMobi. So that, you live and learn. It's fun anyway. We have one question. Will there be a recording of this presentation? Yes, there will be. Um, those will probably be uploaded later in April, I believe. A lot of editing work, I imagine, that has to go on before you can get them all posted up there. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And then can you share the info for the Wisconsin River Paddle? Sure. Um, the uh, Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin just sent out not too long ago their um, paper guide to all of the field trips that they have this year. But that's also available on the Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin website. 
Um, they open field trip, I think April 1st is when the registration for that opens. It's kind of like booking your kids into the best camp in Wisconsin, right? You have to be sitting there on April 1st and ready to refresh your screen and like sign up right away because a lot of these field trips um, fill up right away. And they are keeping field trips quite small this year because of COVID uh, to be safe. And so take a look at that um, program. It's uh, May 17th, I believe. It's a weekday, uh, so I know that might be hard for some, but for folks who are able to come on a weekday, um, and we're do I'm doing that with Tracy Hames, who's also from the Wetlands Association, and Mike Mossman, who's retired from the DNR and knows so much about that riverway, particularly the bird life along the riverway. That's his um, one of his areas of expertise, although he's a very smart man about lots of different things. So um, check that out on the Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin webpage uh, to find their calendar for this year's field trips and get ready to register on April 1st. Awesome, and then another question, how are wetland regions on Wisconsin map defined? That's a great question. Uh, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has a longer list of ecological landscapes that helps them um, you know, with the classification of systems and, and setting priorities and planning. Um, and so we built on that system. We worked with Eric Epstein and other folks at the DNR to, to combine some of the, uh, some of the regions, eco-regions that the DNR needs to use, which needs to be a little bit more fine toothed and ours was gonna be just a little bit more general. So we worked with them to make sure that we were doing combinations that made sense given the purposes that we had uh, in mind here. And that's where our eight regions came from. But there, I don't know, maybe you know, Alex, how many ecological landscapes do you have at the DNR in, in your bigger system? It's like 20 or something. It's a lot more. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> I know the DNR is big and there's lots of, uh, you know, everybody's got their own specialty, so no worries at all. But that's where those regions came from, uh, was, a, was a merging of the ecological landscapes that the DNR uses. We have some thank yous in the chat for a great session. Well, I really appreciate you turning out this morning and listening and learning about our wetlands. There's another talk, I have another talk tomorrow morning, um, if you are curious, also at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so you can come and check that out as well about how wetlands can help lakes and how you can help wetlands. All right. Well, thank you, Katie. Um, thanks for all the great information you've shared with us. Uh, since we're at the end of our time period now, I think we'll conclude this session. For those watching, please remember to take the session feedback survey at the bottom of the page under the session description. Um, we'll have a 20 minute break now on the agenda, which you can use to browse the sponsors or exhibitors. Uh, the next session will begin at 11. And thanks again, everybody. Uh, if you have any other questions for Katie later, you can contact her directly with questions anytime during Wisconsin Water Week. Look her up in the speakers list on the menu tab, or you could click her name directly under the video in this session. Thank right. you so Thanks much for everyone. listening. All right, we should be able to, yeah, stop the streaming. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we had enough time so that it doesn't cut off awkwardly. <laughs> yeah, I think you did it on perfect.